ignore_time_segment_in_scoring Gambia, Angola, China Holding, Gash, producers of the finest tomato paste in the Gambia, Jeja, tomato paste, available in 5 kilos, 1 kilo and in sachets. For wholesale and retail, visit our factory at Banjulanding. We are also producers of Jeja mineral water, cool, clear and fresh. Gash, Gambia, Angola, China Holding, with headquarters at Fatu Golden Plaza, Mile 7, Bertel Harding Highway. Gash Group also provides the best security company. Gash Security for your offices, warehouses, homes, and personal property. Gash Group for all your construction projects, offering you quality water reticulation for your gardens, pump irrigation, tidal irrigation projects, and all types of buildings. You can contact Gash on 396 7894 700 8993 373 0259. Visit us at Gash Global Group on Battle Harden Highway, Fatu Golden Plaza, our website www.gashglobal.com Gambia, Angola, China Holding, Gash It's a warm welcome here in our studio in Sarakunda. This is Star TV News with me, Mamuna Jufadera. In the headlines tonight, the Vice President is summoned to appear in Parliament. My father explained why he resigned his former position as a special presidential advisor. GT Bank staffs embark on a sit-down strike. The Ministry of Environment embarks on a plastic bag awareness campaign on the international scene. Nigerian domestic flights resume amid pandemic. Attack on prominent Lebanese activists raises concern. UK pandemic handling revives calls for independence in Scotland. Well, those were the headlines in now the news in details. The Vice President of the Gambia, Dr. Isa Tuture, has been summoned to appear before the Parliament to answer some questions regarding the unconstitutional state of public emergency extension by President Adam Abaro without the consent of the National Assembly. Our reporter, Mariam Adem, was at the National Assembly in China reports. 
The Gambia Constitution provides that the president may at any time, by proclamation published in the Gazette, to declare a state of public emergency in the Gambia. However, a state of public emergency lasts for seven days, or if the National Assembly is not in session, it can last for 21 days. In the 1997 constitution, a state of public emergency can only be extended prior to its expiration or when a resolution is tabled and approved by two tags of National Assembly members. A standing order empowers for National Assembly member to request a permission from the Speaker to make a statement before the National Assembly on matters relating to public interest. However, the member for Serekunda constituency, Honorable Halifa Sala, issued a statement requesting the vice president to appear before the assembly to answer questions on matters relating to the state of public emergency extension by the president, which is unconstitutional without their consent. I have to remove that this was what it summons the vice president to call and answer three fundamental questions. Why the motion for extension of the state of public emergency for a period of 45 days? This Effect, with effect from Wednesday 4th July 2020, as per the order paper of 30th June 2020 was withdrawn, has the state of emergency been declared since the National Assembly commenced the session? If so, when was it declared and under what authority? What emergency power regulations are currently enforced and under what authority? The how the executive computes time for provision of the expiry, expiry date of each of the declarations of the state of public emergency certificate in my question. Answers to this question will provide sufficient evidence for the National Assembly to determine whether the executive is acting in line with the death and spirit of the Constitution it has taken oath to respect, uphold, and enforce the law. I rest my case after placing it before the judgment seat of prison conscience. Nevertheless, nominated member Yakumba Jete on her statement calls on the president to appear before the parliament instead of the vice president. I think it is necessary not the vice president itself because this is the power that is given directly to the president. For the president himself to come, we have a provision in the constitution and discuss this because this is a matter of national importance. And I would say that if the president come and cannot defend this position, this would call for impeachment and I will put up a notice in this parliament to start an impeachment procedure if the president cannot defend the abrogation of this constitution. Only the National Assembly is given the power by the constitution to extend a state of public emergency so that it will not expire within seven days if the National Assembly is in session or within 21 days if the National Assembly is not in session. The motion was subsequently adopted by the members of parliament and the vice president is expected to appear before the parliament next week to answer the questions. Maria Madem reporting for Star TV News. May Ahmed Fati, who served as the first interior minister in Barra's government and one time a special advisor to the president, spoke to Star TV and explained why he resigned as a special presidential advisor to His Excellency President Adam Abaro Binta Koli Files in this report. My Ahmed Fati said he decided to stop working as a presidential advisor to the president because when he was given the appointment, he promised himself and Gambians that if any time he sees that he is not useful in the position, he would tender his resignation with immediate effect. That was the main reason he decided to quit. According to him, he had no personal problems with the president and Burrow opened all channels for him to be able to do his work effectively and efficiently. But even though he did not feel useful in the position, he said that he was in the position to serve the interests of Gambians and he did not want to be receiving his salary every month without serving Gambians in the most original manner possible. May added that he worked directly under the president and he had no business with others close to him. He was only answerable to his president and advised him on issues that were of paramount importance. Lawyer Fati explained his difficulties as the first interior minister since the coalition government took over office in 2016. He said that no handing over of documents were observed in his transition by his predecessor and that made his work very difficult. According to him, he just worked based on his understanding and experience, but nothing like following files that were previously used. He added that he pushed away all difficulties and tried to structure the security sector of the country. 
He lamented that many people were brought into the country by ex-president Jame to help him eliminate people like Mr. Fati to pave way for him Jame to stay in office. Another problem was that a lot of weapons were lost which they knew nothing about. He said that it was appalling because Jame's junglers were all over the country. The ex-interior minister also said that he had never served in the security sector but he has a lot of experience being a politician as he conducted many researches which showed how prepared he was to run this country. During that time I gained extra knowledge and experience about security, he said. He acknowledged the positive impacts he brought in the security sector when he was the Minister of Interior. He said that we need to empower the security themselves and he did everything he could to empower them. He declared that he gave them the respect they deserve because their work is very vital. Among the measures taken to help the security was to give them the tools and equipment they needed in order to do their work efficiently and freely. For Star TV News, I am Bintokuli. The staff of Guarantee Trust Bank yesterday embarked on a sit-down strike. Workers at the bank said they will not resume work unless management revives their working conditions. They demand better payment incentives and health benefits, among others. Jacqueline Coley was at their headquarters and she now reports. According to some staff, they have been ignored when it comes to promotion. The new MD has sidelined them. He is cherry-picking when it comes to promotion of workers. They informed the media that the newly graduated UTG students were promoted while they have been working there for years. Yet no promotion and their conditions of service are bad. Owing to that, they want better payment, good incentives and reliable health benefits. Meanwhile, in an interview with the brand manager Dudu Bojang, he outlined that one of the reasons why the staff went on the strike is because the management of the bank decided not to promote this year due to the pandemic and other undesirable issues. Mr. Bojang said that the staff sent a letter to the management two days back with a 48-hour ultimatum for their needs to be met and threatened to go on a sit-down strike if the management didn't respond positively. The staff advanced some things that they say um, are not happy about, that they want management to address. And, uh, and so that's why they, they decided to, to not work. How long has that problem existed, persisted? How long? Between management and the staff? No, management only received, only received communique from uh, the staff um, two days ago, I guess, and they gave a 48 hours um, kind of ultimatum. And so, following which they threatened to go on strike, and they did that. Bojan could only disclose one reason for the staff going on a sit down strike. The rest, he denied to disclose the information to this medium. He said that they have a listening management and this is a minor issue that they will work to resolve the soonest. But I only know the insistence for promotion by staff was communicated just a few days ago because they said they had that um, a decision has been taken to not promote this year and they feel that shouldn't be. And um, there are other issues that I, I wouldn't want to discuss here. During their strike, the first deputy governor of Central Bank, Dr. Siku Jabi, was at the GT Bankhead office in Karaba Avenue and told the reporters that the matter will be addressed. The first deputy governor indicated that anywhere in the world, banks don't want noise, so they will address the issue. He assured the staff that by yesterday afternoon, they will meet at the Central Bank and address the matter. He, however, pleaded with the staff to resume work immediately. The strike lasted for over two hours before the staff resumed work. Some of the customers of the bank were disappointed upon arrival at the bank premises, only to be told by the security that the bank is not operational because the staffs are on a sit-down strike. Winston Godwin Shingle said at this point the bank is not professional because the customers could have been notified of such situation before the due date to avoid ruining their plans. If you're a customer and then you keep your money, you want to have access to your money any day you want it. And in the instance where um, you have a relative that is sick and then you need to remove money to pay for, for the operation. So how are you going to get your money? So I think it's affecting us. Even if you are taking your money just to keep it at home, this thing is affecting the whole Gambia because you don't expect a full bank uh, to go on lockdown not notifying their customers, not giving us any information. We don't have anybody to talk to. 
And then when you're coming in the bank to save your money, you have so many people to talk to. Everybody is smiling at you. But for instance, we only have a security, which is not a staff telling us what to do, telling us that they are not working, they are out of service. And for, uh, it's not something that I am happy about, and I'm sure many of their customers will not be happy about it as well. Ibrahim Akeita, also very disappointed by what he was told that the bank was not in service, advised the bank to, not advised the bank to notify their customers if such situation is to happen again. Brand manager Dudu Bojang apologized to their customers for the inconvenience they might have caused them. Jacqueline Colley, reporting for Star TV News. The Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources Management, Honorable Lamin B. Dabo, on Wednesday before the National Assembly members put trust on the practical measures put in place to stop the circulation of plastic bags in the country. Yamuda Okuka has the rest of the story. It could be recalled that the government of the Gambia placed an embargo on the manufacturing, importation and use of plastic bags in the country on the 1st of July 2015. The National Environment Agency, NEA, in collaboration with key stakeholders, have been effectively enforcing the embargo by stopping the importation, manufacturing and use of plastic bags in the country. However, the enforcement has faced lots of challenges in recent years. And the agency believes that the best course of action for now is rigorous sensitization on the ban alongside plan for effectively enforcing the ban and reducing plastics in the waste streams. Notwithstanding, the agency continues to enforce the ban. An incident involved the smuggling of plastic water bags, none from across the border was intercepted at the Amdalai border post. I can try anything. That is why I said this is a multi-stakeholder issue. We are working with the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Employment and also working with the uh, Department of Customs, GI. Uh, I think most of you here will remember in 2018, we impounded a container of plastic where the importer uh, declared that it's plastic shoes. But with uh, some tips, we were able to know that this is not plastic shoe, rather it's plastic. And we, the, in consultation and collaboration with the GRA, we apply the, the law and the person have to take this back to where it comes from and pay the fine. So I think uh, we are also securing the, the, the entry points. We are looking at the entry points. Perhaps tomorrow I will come here with this uh, amendment to the uh, amendment to the Kyoto Protocol and I uh, will uh, talk more about uh, collaboration with the customs, with uh, other security agents about how do we uh, detect these uh, products that are illegal uh, in terms of our international multilateral environment agreements. Tomorrow perhaps maybe I think I have it on the other, uh, other paper which I will talk more about that tomorrow. But, but yes, we are. We are. The Minister of Environment is raising awareness on the issues of the ban on plastic bags order by involving some of the media houses, comedians and musicians such as Deli Bakuyate, the King of Kora, to sensitize the people. The NEA is also working with the Commonwealth Clean Ozon Alliance to devise better ways of removing plastic from the waste streams. For Star TV, I am Yamu no Kuka. We'll now go for a short commercial break. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Manu. Nous <coughs> Angarenjeng, leo sote yake jang, ila sote fengo fengo be yuru wala. Ye, jambando? Ha, he, wato alhamdirida. Sa jambando, mbo sote la nyari le? He, sa nyeng mwoli abla le kata fang kata depo nyinto. Hani, ni futa ta je, depoto sa nyeng buka wafide, kakodo ta mwobulu ka 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 boto di la. Wubo sa nyeng wobo ta le. Sa nyeng mimbe kering wole mnyinto ko, Reliance, ipita wolto ye kodo jo, ni kodo jo Reliance, ika risito li di la. Ba risito nyeng aku matal de, wo risito nyeng ni adila. Ika wole samba, Gambia Groundnut Corporation. Wolle be mara reng ying jambando la kola. 
Andoi la nyinjang, ngalun leli hi nyinjang bando niya kejang. Ifam 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 bafo la nyela. Tumano bar, meja bando kene elfana ngaji be. Nimbo reya, mita wold, mita mita sekoro direct, mita reya direct meja bando sana. Utambari ngol nyewe de nyuli nata la kanamu la handi. Jiji si kajambando dada la mule fadhal si cheme warola. He nyomo alchendo bali. Mbadu watu nimbori baeta ngata na jambando la kudojo. Watajang msaan saan saan mbe utle ngata fo reliance ngana na jambando la kudojo. Jee to ngat ngana risi tota ngata adepo. Walla ngaji be CPMS katu nyuli la fulo. Demi suri atana rek nintara ngaji oje mbe na jambando sotla. Al nimbara bak ala baraka. Alhamdulillah, nyawa mu alat jendu bal, hehehe, moro, moro ni nama tuah bela nusana. Gambia Angola China Holding Gash Producers of the finest tomato paste in the Gambia Jeja tomato paste Available in 5 kilos, 1 kilo and in sachets For wholesale and retail Visit our factory at Banjulanding We are also producers of Jeja mineral water Cool, clear and fresh Gash Gambia Angola China Holding With headquarters at Fatu Golden Plaza Mile 7 Bertel Harding Highway Gash Group also provides the best security company Gash Security for your offices, warehouses, homes, and personal property. Gash Group for all your construction projects, offering you quality water reticulation for your gardens, pump irrigation, tidal irrigation projects, and all types of buildings. You can contact Gash on 3967894700809937302359. Visit us at Gash Global Group on Battle Harden Highway. Fatu Golden Plaza, our website www.gashglobal.com Gambia, Angola, China Holding, Gash Nini ndi setane television mge wacha sopeku buba Eskaf Gambia, nyo ndi DTT Decoder You Best, dingi ndi am TRTS, QTV, Star TV Paradise TV at MTA Tedo Feidara, DTT Decoder You Nyari juni ak nyenfuki dela se rek lamo ijar, takchi dine nyamey luto luti bena wer dinga setane yenen channel Sibir Adi Dinasi tedofe ben khalis. Wai bobege kontine setan luwe su jurom ben nufu ki channel denga wara subscribe. Manam wer buneka denga fey jurom itemir ak fuke dala si rek nga setan. Football leaks yep si ad dinasi. News, African music, telenovela film yu nerg, music, cartoon pur khalei ak yene ni channel. Konak gawle na gawe jendi DTT Dikoda sa eskaf surum bacha seni gambia fi dream park nekon mba seni ejensyo neka chi bi rewmi. Kon len 446 1060-446-1061 at DTT Decoder at Dinabi Mungsisa Chatilokho Welcome back after that third commercial break and we now look at the news beyond our borders. Nigerian domestic flights resume amid pandemic. Domestic flights in Nigeria have resumed after three months of COVID-19 restrictions. Airports in the capital, Abuja and the commercial hub, Lagos, have reopened. Other airports are due to resume flights over the next week. The number of coronavirus cases in Nigeria has surpassed 30,000 with more than 680 deaths. Al Jazeera's Ahmed Idris reports from Abuja. It was a cautious first day for Nigerian air travelers. As passengers arrived to check in, they were confronted by new flight and safety rules that weren't there before the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, Isioma John was eager to fly again. I don't have concerns so far, trusting my country and trusting um, efforts put in place so far. I expect my country and I believe in trust in the system. And I know that it's safe to fly as it's safe to fly in any other country. But traffic was thin on the first day for the resumption of a limited schedule. Government leaders say they have used the past three months when airlines were grounded to address critical infrastructure needs to ensure passenger safety. Sure you've seen in our airports we have marked areas where passengers would be to keep physically distant. We've reduced the capacity of our uh, holes. We've sequenced our flights to come in. Uh, we've regulated the entry and exit of our airports. We've done everything possible to ensure that people are safe. And Despite increasing COVID-19 infections, the government is going ahead with reopening its airspace for domestic flights only to begin with. 
Two airports, this one in Abuja and the other in the commercial capital Lagos, have been chosen to restart domestic flights, with the other airports due to take off soon. Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority will decide on when to allow international flights after seeing how operations work out in these airports over the next two weeks. Nigeria's aviation sector has lost 95% of its revenues in the past three months. The feeling here is the longer airplanes remain grounded, the more the economy will be harmed. This is a country that you have 34% rate of return on your investment. This is a country with 450 billion GDP. This is a country as center of Africa. This is a country that has 20% of the African consumption. So shutting this economy means a total loss for the economy. Therefore, we open it up, uh, but we open it in style. We open it with caution to ensure that everybody stays safe. Aviation officials are happy that the first day of commercial flights since the COVID-19 lockdown went well. What's uncertain is, how will airports cope when both domestic and international flights are allowed to get back into the air. Ahmed Idris, Al Jazeera, Abuja. Attack on prominent Lebanese activists raises concern. A prominent Lebanese activist and independent politician have been assaulted in broad daylight. The opposition has called it part of a campaign of intimidation by the government against the ongoing anti establishment movement. As Al Jazeera Zina Kuduri reports from Beirut, the assault has once again raised concerns about a clampdown on free speech. Seen by security cameras and in broad daylight with their faces uncovered, four men on motorcycles assaulted a prominent activist as he was leaving a radio station. Opponents of Lebanon's leadership say the attack is part of a campaign to silence dissent. Moments later, Wasif Harake describes how he was hit on his head and face with a hard object, but he remains defiant. I was expecting this to happen because of the structure of this police state. If they think that by attacking us we'll back off, they're wrong. Many like Harake linked to the anti-establishment protest movement that began in October say they've been harassed, interrogated and detained. The country is turning into a police state and the intelligence and security forces are working for their ruling alliance. Sharb al Khouri, seen here after his release from detention in February, was questioned for social media posts criticizing those in power. He fears further harassment. The intelligence forces are asking my friends about me. If they call me in, I won't go unless I stand in front of an independent judge, because we all know what they are doing to detainees. They broke my friend's back while he was detained. International human rights groups say the Lebanese authorities are using defamation laws to violate freedom of expression, but party leaders say there is a limit to free speech. There are those who are crossing the red line. They are being summoned by the judiciary and questioned for a few hours, but this doesn't mean freedom of expression in Lebanon is at risk. Opponents disagree. Rights groups report more than 100 violations against activists and journalists by the authorities and supporters of the ruling alliance since the beginning of the year. This square in central Beirut is no longer filled with tents. Protesters have been forced to leave by the authorities. Their movement has largely been broken. Many blame intimidation, violence, fatigue, disillusionment. But in the words of the top UN official in Lebanon, efforts to silence free speech usually backfire, notably in times of crisis. Lebanon is in crisis, and politicians have so far failed to ease growing economic hardships. And as more Lebanese sink into poverty, containing their anger may be a more difficult battle to win. Zana Khudr Al Jazeera, Beirut. UK pandemic handling revives call for independence in Scotland. Support for Scottish independence is higher than it has ever been. Pulling is consistently suggesting more than half of Scots want to leave the United Kingdom. It has been attributed to Scotland's success in controlling coronavirus compared with England and overwhelming Scottish hostility to Brexit. Al Jazeera's Rowlett Lee reports from Scotland. Bert has been dreaming of Scottish independence for as long as he can remember. He regards the English establishment as imperialists who stamped all over Scotland, just as they did the colonies. 
The fact that the independence campaign narrowly lost the referendum six years ago doesn't matter to him because he believes his day will still come. The yes people who are still there, they're still as strong as they were. The people that were marching, the people that march in marches in Glasgow and Edinburgh and all over, uh, they're still, you know, they haven't given it up, but, um, and they won't. Burt lives in Dundee, the heartland of independence. Support for leaving the UK and going it alone polls around 65% here. Now it's going in that direction everywhere else as well. Trust in the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has rocketed since she appeared to be in control of the virus response in Edinburgh, while the government in London is widely regarded as chaotic and incompetent. Add to that the outright hostility in Scotland to Brexit, and you get a lot of good news for Scottish nationalists. They have obviously recognised that the UK government have been so inept in their handling that I think it has persuaded a lot of people who perhaps were not supporters of independence that we can actually manage our own affairs better. And I think when you look at how Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish government have handled the pandemic, it's a big contrast to Boris Johnson and the UK government. The question increasingly being asked here is how big a lead do the nationalists have to have before it becomes impossible for London to refuse another referendum on independence? The extraordinary collision of the pandemic response and Brexit have combined to put support for Scottish independence across the country at around 54% and there's not even any independence campaigning going on. The view among Scottish nationalists is that the government in London is doing a very good job on their behalf. If they haven't given up on another referendum, they haven't given up on blocking Brexit for Scotland either. Next week, we'll see the launch of a new campaign here to keep Scotland in Europe. Just a few months ago, it was unconscionable for the UK to leave without a deal. Now, the Tory government seems to be talking that up. Um, we can't have that, actually. Scotland hasn't voted for it. Scotland is firmly a pro-EU country. And so, yes, we should be campaigning and campaigning hard to ensure that we're back in Europe. The Scottish Government has refused to rule out closing its borders with England if it eliminates the virus, but England doesn't. There's a power struggle going on. At the moment, Scotland is gaining the upper hand. Lawrence Lee Al Jazeera in Scotland. And before we end the news, a quick recap of our main headlines. The Vice President of the Gambia, Dr. Aisa Tuturi, has been summoned to appear before the Parliament to answer some questions regarding the unconstitutional state of public emergency extension by President Adam Barrow without the consent of the National Assembly. My Ahmed Fati, who served as the first interior minister in Barra's government and one time a special advisor to the president, spoke to Star TV and explained why he resigned as a special presidential advisor to His Excellency President Adam Abaro. The staff of Guarantee Trust Bank yesterday embarked on a sit-down strike. Workers at the bank said they will not resume work unless the management revives their working conditions. They demand better payment incentives and health benefits, among others. The Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources Management, Honorable Lamin B. Dabo, on Wednesday before the National Assembly members buttressed on the practical measures put in place to stop the circulation of plastic bags in the country. Domestic flights in Nigeria have resumed after three months of COVID-19 restrictions. Airports in the capital, Abuja and the commercial hub, Lagos, have reopened. All the airports are due to resume flights over the next week. The number of coronavirus cases in Nigeria has surpassed 30,000 with more than 680 deaths. A prominent Lebanese activist and independent politician have been assaulted in broad daylight. The opposition has called it part of a campaign of intimidation by the government against the ongoing anti-establishment movement. Support for Scottish independence is higher than it has ever been. Pulling is consistently suggesting more than half of Scots want to leave the United Kingdom. It has been attributed to Scotland's success in controlling coronavirus compared with England and overwhelming Scottish hostility to Brexit. Well, that's all for this edition of the news. Do enjoy the rest of our programs and join us tomorrow for more news. Thanks for watching and do have a wonderful weekend.